Masons, magicians, and cunning folk. Oh my! We've decided to do things a little bit differently this time around. I know, this early in the game? Up until now, we've been basically covering every chapter paragraph by paragraph. And while that is not entirely without reason, and it aided us in understanding the dense history that Hutton sets up for his narrative, we've decided ain't nobody got time for that. So from here on out, I will be focusing on an actual review of the text and merely guide you through the remaining chapters, and share what I believe to be pertinent information or a particular brilliance that you simply cannot pass up. So to get started, I thought I might just point out some of the most fascinating points in the text and tell you anything and everything I know about them. Nah, I'm just kidding. I'll probably have a little bit more to share with you than that. So, let's get started. How are the Freemasons connected to contemporary paganism? Well, ever heard of so mote it be? Masons. Remember that bit in the craft about falling on the sword? Masons. Bronies? Uh, actually, no, not... maybe the Masons. You'll, you'll see what I mean later. So what about the Masons? They were founded in Scotland in the 1500s, and they spread to England in the 1640s. They were made in vogue with the rise of secret societies. They claimed ancestral lineage to King Solomon and modeled their lodges after his temples, and established initiation rituals. Also, they popularized the notion of ritual garments, tools, and words. By the 1800s, other groups had started calling themselves lodges or guilds based around other various trades or crafts. Competing with the Masons, we have various groups of ceremonial magicians, amongst them Society of the Miller's Word. They tried to sexy up their reputation with stalwarts like devil worship and whiskey. <laughs> also, there was the Horseman's Word, bronies, or horse whispers. Horse whispers rose in popularity when horses replaced oxen as the main animal laborers in farms in Europe. As horsemen started to become more and more prevalent throughout Europe, a lot of people thought they had magical powers since they could get horses to do things that the layman could not do. But horse whispers, millers, and masons aside, why were these societies so popular? One, they claimed antiquity. Everybody believed, and to a certain extent still believe today, that legitimacy comes from antiquity. Two, initiation into these societies promoted a sense of community. Lodges were places of equality and, by extension, safety. Three, societies provided initiates with skills and knowledge. Sounds like an institution that should come back. I would gladly take a position as yeoman or journeyman. The Masons laid the foundation for the Golden Dawn. And I know everyone is just dying to rip me to shreds over how I portray the Golden Dawn, so let's rewind a little bit and go to France. I would like to take this opportunity to point out that it is Hutton who suggests that a one Alphonse Louis Constant, also known as Aliphas Zahed Levi, popularized occultism. According to Hutton's research, Levi actually coined the damn term. He blended Renaissance concepts of magic with his own personal innovations, and exercised artistic license introducing the concepts of the appropriation of Jewish mysticism, Kabbalah, and tarot as a vehicle of occult enlightenment. He knew the difference between upward and downward pointing pentacles, and reinvented the idea of invoking and banishing pentagrams as invoking and banishing spirits. Levi was a contemporary of Blavatsky, and Blavatsky was a contemporary of Samuel Little Mathers. There were at least three or four billion people involved in the formation of the Golden Dawn, so here's just a few. Blavatsky, S.L. Mathers, Levi, and Anna Sprengel. Hutton doesn't really expound upon this German chick. Mathers and his friends uncover a text with information to contact Frau Sprengel, an adept of a medieval secret society of German Rosicrucians. So they call her up, and they're like, Hey, Sprengel, can we, like, start a new society over here stateside? Yeah, das klingt wie eine gute Idee. Awesome, we'll sign your name for you. Uh, uh, okay, das ist wirklich legal. And thus we have the 1888 establishment of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Kinda. By 1891, Frau Sprengel and Blavatsky were dead. Mathers is then contacted by these ascended masters we had talked about, and they give him permission to do whatever the fuck he wants to do with his new temple. But being the mouthpiece of the ascended masters must have been difficult, because by 1909, the Golden Dawn had split into like four different factions. The Isis Urania temple focused on Christian mysticism and disavowed the practice of magic. The temple of Aleister Crowley, which it does have a name, but it's a lot of, like, anagrams and symbols, it doesn't really translate into words, focused on pagan imagery. And finally, Mather's Temple, the Alpha and Omega, and the Stella Matutina Temple were a blend between the two of Christian mysticism and pagan imagery. All of the temples promised control of, or at least partnership with, supernatural entities. Hutton doesn't really mention when any of these temples disbanded, but new temples have sprung up reclaiming the traditions of the Golden Dawn. This points to the fact that the Golden Dawn was indeed a significant influence 
influence on contemporary paganism as it is today. And that, my friends, is all there is to high magic. See? It's that easy. Now go forth and contemplate the universe. However, it seems a tad overkill to invoke the sublime mysteries of the universe to remove a wart. And that is where we come to the cunning folk. Hutton differentiates three groups of practitioners of low magic. Charmers were interested in divination and the curing of specific ailments. The cunning folk could do all the things that the charmers did, but they could also locate stolen goods and remove curses from witches or other cunning folk. Witches, as the third group in this context, represent a kind of iffy matter. Cunning folk could be called a witch if a cunning folk person was doing malicious magic. A witch, again, in this temporal context, was an individual who was rumored or accused of practicing malicious magic against another person. But where did cunning folk get their magic? Well, for starters, they could read. Let me explain. Hutton goes into great detail of the eccentricities of their appearance and demeanor. The clothes they wore, the books they kept, the animal skeletons hanging in their huts, and anything else that made them unique amongst other townsfolk. They were all about keeping up the appearance of being disconnected from the ordinary and somehow in tune with the magical world. Essentially, they were their own caricature. But, going back to literacy, in a still semi-literate society, books were considered to have power in and of themselves. Imagine this, the only book in your house is the Bible, and perhaps only one person in your house can read said Bible, and you can only recognize certain sections based on how they are printed or illuminated on the page. You happen upon the house of a cunning person, and holy shit, they've got a library. A library of books other than the Bible. For you, at that time, that's magic, y'all. So what do I think? Based on Hutton's revelations, I think cunning folk were the progenitors of the contemporary Book of Shadows. Not only did they collect grimoires and tomes, but they also kept personal notebooks. Notebooks that they kept experiences, meditations, and spells in. Sound familiar? To sum up the rest of the chapter, let us briefly touch on what I believe to be Hutton's most significant points about the cunning folk. Technique. A one-on-one -on -one connection with the patient or querent. A psychosoma. Their technique was early-onset sympathetic psychology that includes the implementation of tools, such as a magic mirror, refractive crystal, herbal satchel, a written spell, or even something as simple as a gentle touch and a reassuring word. Possession of their magical items imbued the cunning folk with authority, but the catharsis of the entire process was ultimately dependent upon the client's engagement with the cunning folk. Solitary practice. Did cunning folk ever work together in groups? No. No, they did not. Religion. Did cunning folk have their own religion? No. No, they did not. But were they Christian? Meh. Cunning folk spirituality was kind of across the board. According to Hutton, Fiddler Fines was a regular attendant for church. John Wordstell was a devout Christian, but declined the need for professional clergy. Stanton of Louth shunned worship altogether and declared, once a man becomes a wizard, the devil has hold of him for good. Tradition. Was the cunning craft an inherited tradition? No. Are you surprised? I knew you'd be surprised. There are a few instances of siblings working in tandem, and some cunning folk trying to pass on their wisdom to their children, but this never seemed to take with any notable regularity. Hutton does state that the charmer's tricks of the trade were more passable as idiosyncratic superstition, and that the shade, cast upon a familial head considered to be a witch, was assumed to be something that would rub off on her descendants. What did they gain? Did cunning folk make a profit? Totes! Like their religious affiliations, however, it was again kind of across the board. They could price gouge or act charitably. They could set prices for specific acts, or they could have a standard rate. What is important to note, however, that it was always considered a supplementary income to a day job that usually consisted of tradesmen or artisanship herbalism, or teaching. Some made very little money, and some left the world prestigious and passed on great estates. It was most certainly a situational matter. Let's sum up what we've learned. What did the Masons give us? Adherence to ritual and a sense of community. What did the Magicians give us? Ceremony and a connection to the cosmos. What did the Cunning Folk give us? Kitchen witchery and books of shadows. And that's awesome. All right, there are only three more chapters left of Ronald Hutton's book on the development of contemporary modern witchcraft. The first section deals with the outside influence of pagan Paganism, whereas the second deals with the specific aspects of contemporary Wicca and witchcraft. With only three more chapters left in this section, I think that's where the buck is going to stop. Subscribe to my channel and message me on Facebook or Twitter to let me know what you would like to see in future videos. You're all good sports for sticking with me this far. And please know I am immensely grateful. And as always, merry meet, merry part, and merry meet.